lights trick again, but we are getting started. So let me just say um, before I begin my official introduction that um, we will have time after the lecture for some questions and then we'll have a word from a visitor, <laughs> our, our cultural attache from Ireland is here. And then after all of that, there will be a return to the reception. So you can keep all that in mind. So hello, I'm Sarah Cole. I'm the Dean of Humanities here at Columbia. And I'm delighted to be introducing our keynote speaker, Fintan O'Toole whose talk tonight is entitled GBS versus Ireland, Bernard Shaw and Irish Nationalism. It is a thrill to have Fintan O'Toole on our campus, providing the culminating event for this short symposium and exhibition on George Bernard Shaw in our time. In truth, there's something deeply appropriate about the fact that Fintan O'Toole has written a book about Shaw. It's titled, as you know, Judging Shaw, and it's recently out from the Royal Irish Academy. Since these two men, Shaw and O'Toole, have a great deal in common. Both are great readers of their cultures with an exceptionally broad, even insatiable range of interests, cutting across literature, culture, the arts, politics, and contemporary issues and topics of all kinds. Both are intellectuals with a deeply humane political orientation who seem able to diagnose with biting insight the ironies and hypocrisies of their times and yet both maintain a core sense of conviction that things might, in fact, be better. Both are intensely verbal, literate, and funny. Both understand how words in different guises can and do matter, and both employ words with joy and flair. Shaw is remembered today mostly for his plays. I don't know what posterity will enshrine about Fintan O'Toole, but I will say that one aspect of his massive accomplishment calls to my mind not so much Shaw as Shaw's peer, friend, and at times nemesis, H.G. Wells. Wells was willing to embrace the power and importance of writing genres that are meant to be ephemeral, that do not proclaim their immortality. These genres, the newspaper column, the review, the essay as long-form journalism, the polemic, the introduction, are forms in which Fintan O'Toole has excelled. In fact, his writing in these and related forms amounts to a genuine cultural intervention. Readers in many parts of the world, especially in Ireland and the UK, have read the words of Fintan O'Toole for three decades. He is a force, or better a voice, that has penetrated contemporary thought and given his many readers important ways to think about their world. As an arts editor and weekly columnist, he has helped shape the voice of the Irish Times, a primary outlet for his work. And he writes regularly for such journals as The Guardian, The Observer, Granta, The New York Review of Books, and The New Yorker. So Fintan O'Toole is an exemplary journalist. He is also a literary critic, as well as a cultural and colonial historian. He has written a long list of books on a range of topics, many of them about the history, politics, and culture of Ireland. These works constitute something like a history of the Irish present. On the literary side, he has written monographs, monographs about Shakespeare, Sheridan, the Irish playwright Tom Murphy, and of course, Shaw. He has also, I understand, taken on the formidable project of authoring Seamus Haney's official biography. I don't know if that's true, but that sounds like a big deal. The <laughs> Doctor has received many honors and awards, including the 2017 Orwell Prize for Journalism, a prestigious honor given to recognize, quote, honest writing and reporting, which is willing to take on uncomfortable truths. Currently, he is the Leonard L. Milberg 53, or class of 53, lecturer in Irish letters at Princeton University, a position I believe he's held um, uh, in repeated springs. I, however, think of him as an urbanite and a cosmopolitan, a Dubliner, and am therefore especially happy to be hosting him in New York City and at Columbia. Please join me in welcoming our very distinguished speaker. Um, good evening, and uh, thank you all very much for being here. Um, thank you to the wonderful panelists. Uh, very hard job to, to, to follow uh, such brilliant scholars. Um, and thank you to everybody, to Ratu Eileen, and to everybody who's been involved in, in, in hosting us here. Um, the general rubric for, for today has been um, Shaw, our contemporary, uh, and we could talk about this in, in so many different ways. Um, for example, Shaw is contemporary in that 
um, he banished from, not just from the stage, but from public discourse, and I, a toxic idea which is again prevalent, which is the idea that poverty is a moral failing. Um, you know, we, we're in a country where the poor do not deserve food stamps unless they can prove their moral worth. Um, Shaw, by the time he died in 1950, thought he had finished that idea once and for all. Um, that great speech in um, Pygmalion, do little speech about the problem of, the, of being the undeserving poor. And, you know, what, what, why, what, why can't I get stuff? I'm undeserving. You know, this, uh, the mockery of the whole notion that morality is linked to wealth uh, was, was one of Shaw's greatest achievements, and it is as vital to us now as it, as it ever was. The ways in which Shaw shows gender and, and class, social class as being performances, um, I think have, have never been as, as, as um, dynamically and vibrantly necessary uh, than, than they are now. But the bit that I, I, I thought I might talk about is, um, is, is, is an issue which we all have to confront at the moment, which is nationalism. Um, nationalism is the great political force on the rise across um, across Europe, being from, from from Russia all the way across, um, and of course in America, the uses and abuses of American nationalism are very much living questions. And so I thought I would just talk about about Shaw's relationship to nationalism, and in particular to Irish nationalism. Um, what we're I suppose all trying to deal with at the moment is a set of options around a relationship to nationalism, where on the one side um, we're invited, I think, to say nationalism is, is fundamentally irrational and stupid and therefore we should just hope it goes away, uh, and on the other side we're invited to embrace it as the core of authenticity, which proves that you're not a member of that worst possible thing, the elite. Uh, to be a nationalist is, 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 is to have that sort of personal as well as communal authenticity. And these are, of course, false alternatives. And, and, and I think Shaw's example in his relationship to Irish nationalism suggests the possibility of something else, which is a kind of critical nationalism. Uh, an honoring and, and acceptance of the claims of national identity. Um, without allowing those claims to uh, numb one's brain. Uh, and uh, you know that by accepting the claims of nationalism, we can also then have the right to question its outcomes. And that's what Shaw does with Irish nationalism. Um, so I'd just like briefly to start with, with um, February 17th, 1846, uh, the second year of the Great Hunger, of the greatest catastrophe in Irish history, one of the great, uh, proportionally the greatest um, famine, most deadly famine in, in, in known human history, uh, has been raging. And a speaker, uh, the Member of Parliament for Trinity College Dublin, um, rises in, in, in the House of Commons in, in London. Uh, this is reported in the third person, as, as it often was, in Hansard. He would not willingly say a word that would check the sympathies of the House or the government towards his poor and always suffering fellow countrymen. But as the question of the potato failure in Ireland had become so prominent in the debates of the House and so paramount in influencing the measures of the government, he thought it right to inform the House of the real facts of the case, as he believed them to be without adding to or taking away from them. There was scarcely a season in Ireland, especially towards its close, that there was not scarcity and consequent distress in many parts of the country. That there would be an aggravation of the usual periodical distress during the ensuing season, he grieved to say he could not doubt. But still, he was bound to add that he considered very exaggerated statements had been put forth, and undue alarm excited on the subject. All he had risen for was to deprecate the exaggeration of while he did not desire to understate the evil. Uh, a month later, the same speaker uh, had been, his earlier speech had been referred to by Sir Robert Peel, um, and the same speaker who didn't speak very much, but he rose again to say, 
the Right Honourable Baroness Sir Robert Peel has misrepresented what I said. I did not accuse the government of willful exaggeration. I did not accuse those who misled the government of willful exaggeration. But I said, but I am ready to maintain, that the statements as to the potato failure in Ireland were in fact exaggerated. And uh, so far as we know, he continued to maintain the same position throughout. The speaker was called Sir Frederick Shaw. He was the um, second cousin of Bernard Shaw, much older second cousin of Bernard Shaw, and he belonged to the more successful part of the Shaw family. Uh, Shaw's own family had, um, had Shaw invented, he got two words into the Oxford English Dictionary that he was very proud of, one of which of course was Shavian, um, which he, he worked very hard to, to, to get accepted into the language. Um, the other one was downstart, uh, as opposed to upstart. Uh, he, he defined his own position as being that of a downstart. A downstart and the son of a downstart. So his, his, his father, uh, who came from this uh, very distinguished, very wealthy um, Irish Protestant Shaw family, um, had been somewhat falling out of favour with his better, more respectable relatives due to his drinking uh, and his lack of success in business. Um, but nonetheless, um, Shaw grew up as part of, he was one of the Shaws. And he was one of the Shaws who, who could stand up in the House of Commons and say the famine was exaggerated and, and we shouldn't be too alarmed by it. Um, <coughs> Shaw himself uh, later recalled that um, his family, and I quote, talked of themselves as the Shaws, as who would say the Valois, the Bourbon, the Hohenzollerns, the Habsburgs, and the Romanovs. Um, so he grew up with a very strong sense of being a Shaw in, in that sense. And I'd like to just flash forward to, I think, what's the strangest scene in, in probably all of Shaw's 60 plays. It's quite a large claim. And, uh, not, not subject to uh, empirical verification, since nobody has ever actually read all 60 plays. But there, there is an extraordinary moment in, in Man and Superman uh, where you get a kind of um, a, 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 an exaggerated historical effect that seems very out of place um, for, for Shaw. It, and it's, it's only to do, it's a, it's, it's a pure matter of mechanical subplot. So, uh, you know, the classic Commedia dell'arte plot is always about the older people, the parents, or usually the father, trying to block the marriage of the two young people who fall in love. It's, it's pretty standard fare. And in the subplot of Man and Superman, uh, we have um, uh, Hector, who is um, the young American who's fallen in love with, with Violet, who is a lovely um, but middle class English woman. And um, at this point in the play, we suddenly encounter Hector's father. And Hector's father has come to stop the pot potential marriage of Hector to Violet. And Hector's father is called Malone. And it's absolutely clear he's arrived from Irish America. Uh, he's made good and he approaches Violet, who's having her breakfast in Madeira, of all places, uh, on the terrace. And he approaches her and basically tells her, you're not marrying my son. Um, and, uh, you know, she says, well, he loves me. And, and Malone says, um, He'll get over it right enough. Men thrive better on disappointments in love than on disappointments in money. I dare say you think that's sordid, but I know what I'm talking about. And then you have this extraordinary eruption. He says, my father died of starvation in Ireland in the Black 47, Black 47, the worst year of the famine, 1847. Maybe you've heard of it. And poor Violet, <coughs> poor nice Violet, Violet says, the famine? And Malone says, with smoldering passion, is the stage direction. No, the starvation. But a country is full of food and exporting it. There can be no famine. My father was starved dead. And I was starved out to America in my mother's arms. English rule drove me and mine out of Ireland. Well, you can keep Ireland. I and my like are coming back to buy England. And we'll buy the best of it. I want no middle class properties and no middle class women for Hector. And, and it's an extraordinary overreach. You know, it's it's not 
necessary to the plot. I mean, adult fellas stop their poor daughters from marrying for all sorts of reasons, I and mean, it can be, you know, it could be anything. But it's famine. And there's a speech in the, in the middle then of Man and Superman. You know, the, the famine arises in this sort of raw, passionate, vicious way, which is completely out of John Mitchell, completely out of 19th century Irish nationalism, um, the rage about the famine. Um, and it's, it's <clears throat> oddly unremarked, this speech, because you don't expect it in Shaw. It's, it's not what you think Shaw's about. Um, and uh, nevertheless, it's, it's very striking that um, late in his life, uh, two, three, four, sorry, four years I think before he, before he died, three and a half years before he died, in, in August 1946, um, Eamon Zavalera wrote to Shaw, uh, Eamon Zavalera being, of course, the great sort of dominant figure of Irish nationalism. At the time, Taoiseach, Prime Minister, wrote to Shaw, somewhat reluctantly, I think, he was told he should do it, um, to congratulate him on his 90th birthday. And Shaw wrote back to him, um, and of course, typical Shaw one-upmanship, he, he, he couldn't write to the embodiments of Irish nationalism without making it clear that he was an Irish nationalist before De Valera was born. Um, and he says, um, I was no more than 10 years old when I deliberately, deliberately gave up praying, which of course is really provocative to the very Catholic De Valera, deliberately gave up praying and became an infidel and sympathized with the Fenians. Now the Fenians is the Irish nationalist revolutionary tradition, the secret society uh, pledged to use violence to overthrow British rule in Ireland. Um, uh, the, the progenitors really of, of the IRA um, through, throughout 20th century Irish history later on. Um, so, so Shaw um, deliberately in an act of one-upmanship, but also reminding de Valera, you know, I, I was a Fenian before you were. Um, and, and, and he's quite serious about this in the sense that one of the simple things about Shaw is that he was an Irish nationalist all his life. Uh, there was never a moment when he, when he didn't believe in the right of Ireland to self-determination um, and to choose its own political future. Um, he, he fell out of love with Fenians when they started bombing people in London um, and, and, you know, disagreed with that kind of infantile insurrectionary violence. But, but he did not ever resile from the basic Fenian position, which is that Ireland is a separate entity to Britain and must therefore have the right to its independence. He is, in that simple sense, an Irish nationalist. More than that, um, a large part of Shaw's provocative stance towards England, the, the creation of GBS, I would argue, is actually fueled by a, a lingering boyhood attachment to one of the great uh, fuels of Irish nationalism, which is the attraction of martyrdom. Um, Shaw likes being, <clears throat> likes playing at least, with the idea of sedition and treason. So he doesn't just present himself in England as a provocative socialist, a feminist, a vegetarian, all of those things. He presents himself as a foreigner who, who, who therefore has no compunction about saying the things that you don't want to hear because he owes you no allegiance. And this is a really important part of Shaw's public persona in England, really throughout his career. Um, at the moment of biggest danger for Shaw, the, the, the moment when Shaw ceases to be funny for the English, ceases to be just a clown, and suddenly becomes a really serious political and moral figure, is at the absolute height of war hysteria in November 1914, when, when the First World War is still innocent and pure, and you know there's no sense of where it's going to lead, the full horror of what it's going to be. The, the idea of pure patriotism, all of Shaw's friends, all of his closest allies are hugely enthusiastic about the war. And at that moment, Shaw does the bravest thing he probably ever did, which is publish Common Sense about the war. Everybody's waiting to hear what he would write. And, and he wrote a very long um, essay on, on called Common Sense about the war, which was published in full in the New York Times, for example. It's a full edition of the New Statesman is taken up, it becomes as Lucy would say, a great controversy. I mean, it's a great controversy about Shaw's view of the war. 
which attacks the whole idea that the war is a moral cause, that there is a distinction between English innocence and German perfidy, uh, or a distinction between German Junkerism uh, as a cause of the Prussian Junkerism as a cause of war and the supposedly nice English aristocracy, you know, who, who would never dream of going to war. Uh, you know, it's, it mocks all of that. But it's very interesting to just look at the beginning of that because he, he starts common sense about the war by saying, I owe you no allegiance. And I owe you no allegiance, he says, until home rule, this means Irish home rule, emerges from its present suspended animation. So uh, home rule for Ireland had been uh, passed by the British Parliament and then is suspended because, the, uh, because of the outbreak of the First World War. So Shaw frames common sense about the war as saying, you know, until you pass home rule, I, I, I have no allegiance to any kind of polity on these islands. And he says, until home rule emerges from its present suspended animation, I shall retain my Irish capacity for criticizing England with something of the detachment of a foreigner, and perhaps with a certain slightly malicious taste for, for taking the conceit out of her. Lord Kitchener, the uh, commander-in-chief at the time of the British Armed Forces, made a mistake the other day in rebuking the Irish volunteers for not rallying faster to the defense of their country, which he puts in uh, quotation marks. They do not regard it as their country yet. Um, and this is a large part of, of, of Shaw's provocation. It's continual provocation. Um, and and we'll, we, we, we'll see to some extent where this goes. Um, but Shaw is, uh, in many ways, um, a, a lot of Shaw's politics are Marxist, a lot of his playwriting is Marxist, a lot of his approach to intellectual questions is to follow the money, to look for the economic base um, that explains the interests that people have. However, he does not apply Marxism to nationalism. Um, one of the reasons why Shaw is actually an interesting thinker about nationalism itself um, is that he very early on makes that sort of leap from saying, you know, nationalism is just a kind of disguise for particular interests, to saying nationalism is an organic fact, just exists. Um, and he talks about national aspirations. Uh, one of the images he uses is that of a sword tooth. Uh, as he puts it, a sword tooth is rationally a pretty small part of your body. Your body can function perfectly well with a sore tooth. Uh, it doesn't stop you from carrying on your your day-to-day -day business. Um, but the person who has a sore tooth can't think about anything else until it's dealt with. Um, and uh, in 1888, after the defeat of the first Home Rule Bill, uh, which was a, a, a key moment of defeat for for for, for Irish nationalism. Shaw pointed out that it was useless to discuss the question of nationalism as if it were a utilitarian matter. Nationalism, he writes, is surely an incident of organic growth, not an invention. A man discusses whether he shall introduce a roasting jack into his kitchen, but not whether he shall introduce an eye tooth into his son's mouth, or lengthen him as he grows older. More vividly, and of course in, in biblical terms, Shaw uses the Bible um, much more than any atheist should, um, but he describes in 1913, he talks about specifically Irish nationalist fervor as a burning fire shut up in the bones, a pain, a protest against shame and defeat, a morbid condition which a healthy man must shake off if he is to keep sane. But what Shaw always says is the only cure for nationalism is, is to basically, it's the Wildian cure. So Wilde says, you know, the only way you can cure temptation is to give into it. And, and Wilde says the only way you can cure nationalism is, is to actually deal with the shame and defeat. If it's a protest against shame and defeat, then you must deal with it. You must deal with, with, with those sources. Um, and so what, what he always argues is that Shaw must, uh, that, that Ireland must be given its independence so that it can stop thinking about being Irish. Um, so it's, it's, it's a paradoxical view, but, but nevertheless a powerful one. 
Um, we must remember, of course, a couple of things. One is that Shaw is, is also, of course, always a Republican. Uh, so, so Shaw's Irish nationalism is of the Republican variety. Um, in 1916, uh, just after the Easter Rising, which of course restated republicanism as the, the core form that Irish nationalism is supposed to take, the Easter 1916 Rising, um, Shaw wrote for the Fabian Society a proposed manifesto of republicanism, uh, which the Fabian Society rejected, calling for the end of the First World War to be the occasion for the abolition of all monarchies um, and for the establishment in Britain of a republican political party. Um, the roots of these arguments actually go back to Arms and the Man, where the hero of Arms and the Man, of course, is the citizen of the Swiss Republic, Sergius, um, who makes a nonsense of the aristocratic pretensions all around him. Um, and it's, it's, but it is particularly poignant that uh, Shaw's main response in England to the Easter Rising in Ireland, um, which had claimed the establishment of an Irish Republic is to propose the establishment of an English Republic or a British Republic. Um, so, um, for, for most of his, his, his career, um, Shaw uh, retains this, this sense of Irish nationality, not just as a kind of passive fact, but as a kind of provocation. Right? It's, it's, it's an opening to this stance of uh, sedition. And this really manifests itself um, in the two <clears throat> ways in which Shaw, um, somewhat tangentially, but I think nonetheless very interestingly, interacts with the 1916 Rising itself. Um, one of the extraordinary things about Shaw is that although he's from a very non-nationalist Irish background, and although he spends most of his life in England, he retains a really fundamental understanding of the mechanisms of Irish nationalism, particularly around the idea of martyrdom. So he understands martyrdom, which of course is a sort of religious concept, and again this is not necessarily what you expect with Shaw, but he, he understands martyrdom really fundamentally. Um, in the week following the Easter 1916 rising, when the British are still the start of the executions of the leaders, at this time, most Irish nationalists are still treating the 1916 Rising as a sort of unfortunate, mad outbreak, after which things will go back to normal, which is parliamentary Irish nationalism. Um, most English commentary, of course, is treating it as a horrible stab in the back, an act of treason while we're at war with the Germans. Shaw is the first public figure um, in, in Britain or Ireland, I think, to publish saying, if you, shoot, if you keep shooting these men, you have lost Martyrdom itself will doom you. Um, he wrote to the uh, London Daily News on the 10th of May, 1916. He'd written to various newspapers who refused to publish his letters, so he'd probably written these earlier, but they were published later. Um, but he says um, uh, that he asks his readers in England to imagine that the Germans have won the war. And he just says, imagine the Germans have won the war. And a group of ludicrous, hot-headed, crazy English guys occupy some public buildings in London in protest against German rule. What would you think if the Germans shot them? How would you feel? You know, what would that make you think? Wouldn't those men forever be sacred in English imagination? You know, wouldn't they be transformed, however crazy you thought they were, into um, figures who would have the sort of potency of martyrdom? Uh, he says the, Ger the Germans said, he said that this they would uh, if the Germans shot an Englishman like this it would make him a martyr and a hero even though the day before the rising he may only have been a minor poet the shot Irishmen will now take their places beside Emmett and the Manchester martyrs in Ireland and beside the heroes of Poland and Serbia and Belgium in Europe and nothing in heaven or earth can prevent it um, and so, so Shaw is kind of drawn towards the idea of martyrdom in, in a sense through his own provocations, but he also understands, I think, its, its potency as a political reality. It's very striking, the first, the, the one kind of concrete effect you could say that Shaw has on militant Irish nationalism um, is in the formation of one of the two 
militant groups who take part in the rising. So there's the, the Irish Volunteers, who were the mainstream one, and then there was a the small socialist um, army called the Irish Citizen Army, um, which was led by James Connolly. <clears throat> and the Citizen Army was formed in 1913 uh, as a protective force for the workers in the great Dublin lockout, the huge labour dispute in, in, in Dublin. Shaw appears in um, November 1913 with James Connolly on a platform in the Albert Hall in London to raise money for the strikers. And um, in his, his speech, it's extraordinarily provocative and very deliberately so. And what, what he says is, it has been the practice ever since the modern police were established in difficulties with the working class to let loose the police and tell them to go and do their worst to the people. Now, if you put the policeman on the footing of a mad dog, it can end in only one way, that all respectable men will have to arm themselves. And at, at this point, the reporting says a voice in the hall shouts out saying, are, are you saying the strikers should arm themselves? And Shaw says, I suggest you should arm yourself with something that would put a decisive stop to the proceedings of the police. And then, interestingly, he goes on to very deliberately taunt the authorities. He says, I hope that observation will be carefully reported. I would rather like to be prosecuted for sedition and have the opportunity of explaining to the public exactly what I mean. But two weeks after this, Connolly announces that, in fact, Shaw's suggestion is being taken up by the strikers and they're forming what they call the Irish Citizen Army. And in December, after the first time when the Irish Citizen Army armed marches with the strikers and they are not attacked by the police, um, Connolly writes in his own newspaper an article kind of triumphantly describing this uh, and how the police backed off uh, against the armed strikers. Uh, and the headline that Connolly put in the article is Arms of the Man which I think is a, a very deliberate kind of tipping of the hat to Shaw. Um, so, so Shaw was already kind of mobilizing these ideas of sedition, of provocation, and of, of uh, the idea of, of an armed workers' militia, which does sort of feed into what happens in 1916. Um, but the, the second um, interaction that Shaw has with, with the Rising, which I, I, I won't go into too much detail about, but he's he is approached after the rising, after the first uh, set of executions. The most internationally known figure in the rising was Roger Casement. Roger Casement was really one of the great founders of international human rights, um, really important precursor of things like Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International. Casement had done, on, pretty much on his own, enormous investigations into the abuses in the rubber trade uh, in the Congo, the, the appalling um, practices of the, of, the, of, of the Belgians in the Congo, and then had done his own investigation into the abuses of the indigenous peoples in, in Peru in the rubber trade, and published both, both of these groundbreaking reports. And so Casement was a kind of famous figure, he'd been knighted by the British. And he had, he had, he had then gone to Germany to seek German help for an Irish rising against the British. And, uh, Shaw is approached, because he's the most famous Irish person, uh, by the people who are trying to stop Casement from being hanged. Um, Casement's going to be put on trial for high treason. And Shaw, um, I, I think they, basically it's a woman called Alice Stopford Green, who is very close to Casement, and, and she approaches Shaw, and um, I think she just wants Shaw to just give a lot of money to hire lots of good English lawyers. And She's very angry when he doesn't do this, because what Shaw says is, it, um, that's the worst thing you can do. If, if, you, if you have really good lawyers, the British will be really happy about hanging them. They will, you know, all their sense of gentlemanly pride will be, will be fulfilled. They'll feel, you got a really fair trial, you got a great trial. And, and Shaw's point is, look, he's guilty. He, he did go to Germany. He did try to get arms from the Germans. He, he nearly succeeded in doing this. Like, it, it, there's no point in contesting the evidence. So don't have a trial. Turn it into, and what Beatrice Webb, who's there, is horrified listening to him saying this. And she says, what he wants to do is, is produce a great national drama. And this is exactly what Shaw proposes to do. So what he tries to do with Casement is, he writes a speech for Casement to deliver. 
And it's, it's essentially a kind of dramatic monologue. Um, and it's a dramatic monologue which is to be delivered, so don't contest the evidence, don't do anything, just you personally address the jury. Go over the heads of everybody. And what he invited Caseman to say in this great national drama was that he's not English. So, so, so it's a very simple strategy. That, that, and it's, of course, a Shavian strategy, which is to use paradox, to turn it around, to say, yes, absolutely I did. Of course I did what you, 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 know, what you, you think I did. But it's not treason. So how can I be a traitor? I'm not English. Um, and, and in the speech, he has Caseman say, um, and of course he picks up on his own thoughts about the martyrdom of the uh, people who had previously been shot. He, he has Caseman say, in, in this kind of shavy and ventriloquism, if you persist in treating me as an Englishman, you bind yourself, therefore, to hang me as a traitor in the eye, before the eyes of the world. Now, as a simple matter of fact, I am neither an Englishman nor a traitor. I am an Irishman captured in a fair attempt to achieve the independence of my country, and you can no more deprive me of the honours of that position or destroy the effects of my effort than the abominable cruelties inflicted 600 years ago on William Wallace in this city where he met a precisely similar indictment with a precisely similar reply have prevented that brave and honourable Scot from becoming the national hero of his country. Um, and so, so Shaw is... is is, is, is not just an Irish nationalist, he's an Irish nationalist who's very interested in actually using the most irrational parts of Irish nationalism. But again, using them with a Shavian twist. So the twist here is, of course, that the whole point is that you, you evoke the power of martyrdom in order not to be a martyr. So the whole point is that actually, in the end, this will save casement. What Shaw is doing is taking a completely hackneyed Irish national drama, which is the, the speech from the dock. Robert Emmett being the most famous case of this, but you know, you, you are an Irish revolutionary, you get arrested, you get tried for treason, uh, you get found guilty, you get sentenced to death, and then you make a brilliant speech from the dock, and then you get hanged. What Shaw says is, actually, just because you're trying to avoid the hanging bit. Um, maybe that's not, and of course, he's, he's already written The Devil's Disciple, which, which ends with, you know, Dick Dudgeon is going to be hanged. And then actually, no, he's just not hanged at the end. You know, the anticlimax is wonderful. And he's looking for a kind of anticlimactic Irish nationalism, so that you could sort of use all of that power of martyrdom, and then say, yeah, you know, it's, it's really powerful, but, but maybe it might be a good idea not to get hanged as well. Um, and so what he wants case to do is saying, don't, you know, you, because I'm an Irishman, you can't hang me. Because if you did, I would be a martyr. And you don't want to make martyrs, do you? Because this, this, is, this is such a powerful thing. So he's, he's extraordinarily, uh, adept at, at actually using the inner language of militant Irish nationalism. Uh, in, in a way, it's almost mysterious. You know, it's very hard to know where it comes from, just as it's very hard to know where that speech about the famine comes from in the middle of, of Man and Superman. It arises from something, some deep connection that he has to all of this. But the important thing then about Shaw is that because he understands it and because he's able to connect to its very deepest irrational sources, he's also one of the greatest critics of Irish nationalism. He can, he can therefore critique Irish nationalism with, an ex with extraordinary intelligence and prescience. And there are basically three really important ways in which Shaw tries to qualify Irish nationalism. Um, and I'll, I'll just try to deal with it briefly. Um, the, the first critique of nationalism that Shaw puts forward is to say nationalism is really important, a sense of national identity, a sense of national independence is really important, but don't for God's sake start thinking that it has anything to do with ethnic identity. You know, that, that concepts like race and ethnicity are just nonsense. Uh, there is no basis to any of them. His view of Ireland, the, the Irish nationalists always kind of bemoan the plantation of Ireland, you know, the settlement of English and Scottish people in Ireland. And of course, Shaw's point is that well, everybody in Ireland is a planter. Everybody was planted at some point, you know. But there's no distinction to be made on ethnic grounds between who is purely Irish and who is not. Um, and uh, he, um, as he says, there is, there is no Irish race any more than there is an English race or a Yankee race. Um, in uh, John Bull's other island, Larry Doyle, who's a kind of Shavian alter ego, 
Irishman, um, says, uh, when people talk about the Celtic race, I feel like a burned down London. That sort of rot does more harm than 10 coercion acts. Um, we just had a brilliant uh, discussion about Yeats and Shaw. Of course, one of the great distinctions between Yeats and Shaw is that, that Shaw has absolutely no time for Celtic twilight, you know, for, for any single part of it. Um, he uh, actually wrote rather mischievously um, that, uh, speaking about the Celtic revival, he says that all that side of the Irish movement is not Irish. It was invented in Bedford Park, London West, which was, of course, Yeats's home in London. Um, so, um, uh, uh, and of course, you, you have to understand that the, the core of Irish nationalism, the great claim of 19th century nationalism, is linguistic. So, 19th century nationalism is based around the idea that if you've got your own language, you are a separate people, and therefore you have the right to have your own country. But also, of course, the corollary of that is that if you don't have your own language, you are not a separate people and don't have the right to independence. So, Linguistic difference is, is at this time absolutely central to the whole notion of nationalism. And Shaw has no interest in the Irish language whatsoever. Um, he wishes to tell Irish people that, the, you know, it's a bit like the scene in, you know, Monty Python, uh, The Life of Brian, you know, what, what did the Romans ever do for us, you know? <laughs> and and Shaw's great argument is about what the English did for us is English language, you know. We're better at it than them. It's, it's you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's given us so much. Um, it's the language, as he says, of Swift. You know, it's not even, of course, it's also the language of Shakespeare for him, but it's also the language of Swift. And uh, he says the English language is Ireland's most priceless acquisition and conquest. Um, and uh, he asked Simon de Valera in that same letter I mentioned, what will become of me if you extinguish the language of Swift in Ireland? In 1910, when he, he uh, for the first time, came back to speak in Dublin, I mean, he, he avoided his own city, really, quite for quite a long time, but he, he finally came back to speak in Dublin, and and um, I'll return to what he says. But one of the things he 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 sort of provokes his Irish audience about is the Irish language, and he says that um, wouldn't it be wonderful if if this audience, which was made up of I suppose the Irish Catholic bourgeoisie, um, who were pleased to see this Irish celebrity coming back. And he says, um, wouldn't it be great if you were less concerned with whether fluent Irish was coming out of the mouths of Irish children than with the state of the teeth in those mouths? Um, so, and some members of the audience hissed these sentiments. Um, he threatened that if they hissed them again, he would speak to them in Gaelic, and then we would see where we are. <laughs> um, great laughter, the newspaper report says in, in, in brackets. Um, and then he said, okay, I propose a compromise. If I admit that it would be delightful for Irish girls to learn Gaelic, would the audience admit that there should be some clinic to look after their teeth? Um, so he's not interested in sort of any ethnic or linguistic claim on nationality. Um, and one of the things that he's, he's interested in um, is, I so the second big qualification he has about Irish nationalism is, what else have you got? This is the question he continually asks. But he keeps saying, well, okay, if this is the store tooth, if you take out the tooth, what's the body? What are you actually left with? What do you want a nation for? Um, and his problem with Irish nationalism is that it crowds out exactly those questions about the clinic for the kids' teeth, as opposed to what language they're speaking. It crowds out those social questions. Um, Shaw has a fabulous kind of counter myth of Irish nationalism in Back to Methuselah, which nobody ever reads because it's very, very long and in some cases very boring. Uh, but there's a great moment in it where um, it's, it's set in the year 3000 AD. It's a science fiction play, really, but this, 3000 AD on Burren Pier, which um, you can see him on one of the photographs outside, actually, uh, in the west of Ireland. And a man arrives from the new centre of the British Empire, which is, is Baghdad. Um, uh, and he's looking for the Irish, and the Irish are gone. There's no, there's no trace of the Irish. They can't be found anywhere. Um, and there are these kind of this race of super intelligent, blonde living people who've now occupied the west of Ireland. And um, uh, he, he asked them what happens to them, and, and they say, uh, well, he said, you, you know, the, the, the Irish, um, uh, the, the big problem with the Irish was they got their freedom eventually. You know, they won. And then, you know, they didn't know what to do. 
Um, so he says they, the Irish then, and I, I quote, they emigrated to the countries where there was still a nationalist question, to India, Persia, and Korea, to Morocco, Tunis, and Tripoli. In these countries, they were ever foremost in the struggle for national independence, and the world rang continually with the story of their sufferings and wrongs. And what poem can do justice to the end when it came at last? Hardly 200 years had elapsed when the claims of nationality were so universally conceded that there was no longer a single country on the face of the earth with a national grievance or a national movement. Think of the position of the Irish, who had lost all their political faculties by disuse except that of nationalist agitation, and who owed their position as the most interesting race on earth to their sufferings. The very countries they had helped to set free boycotted them as intolerable bores. <laughs> the communities which had once idolized them as the incarnation of all that is adorable in the warm heart and witty brain fled from them as from a pestilence. To regain their lost prestige, the Irish claimed the city of Jerusalem on the ground that they were the lost tribes of Israel. Mm. But on their approach, the Jews abandoned the city and redistributed themselves throughout Europe. <laughs> So, uh, th this again, uh, I suppose, dr draws our attention to, to Charles' kind of constant question about what happens afterwards. Um, and one of the things that he's, he's, he's uh, really deeply, deeply concerned about is um, the question of, of social policy, obviously. Um, this idea of the, the Irish um, scattering so, you know, Shaw's extremely conscious of the fact that Ireland is a place that people leave. Um, and he's very, again, very perceptive in qualifying the idea of Irish nationalism, but is, can you have a nation state in a place where most people aren't in, in, in the place? Um, in a way, he's sort of always asking that question that's asked of Leopold Bloom in, 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 in Ulysses, where Bloom comes under pressure, people knowing that he's of Jewish origin, you know, what is a nation? And, 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 and Bloom says, initially says, well, it's the same people living in the same place. And then, of course, because he's Jewish and he says, are in different places. Um, and, and Shaw's always asking a question about living in different places. So Shaw's plays are full of people with Irish names, like Henry Higgins, for example, um, who we assume from their names must, must, be, must have been Irish, but have completely forgotten about it or are uninterested in it. You know, uh, as well as people like Hanto Dada, who have a sort of you know, exaggerated version of 18th century Irishness. Um, but one of the things that Shaw's really prescient about is that this will continue. That, that if you don't have a real sense of what it is you want to achieve after independence, then your independence will be sort of utterly paradoxical because your people will continue to depart from the place. And so your idea of this kind of bounded nation state is simply not going to work. Um, in um, John Bull's Other Islands, there's a, there's a actually brutal, brutal statement towards the end of it, where Haffigan, who is the sort of uh, Irish chancellor, you know, has discussed what's going to happen to Haffigan. And uh, they said, well, Haffigan had better go to America, or into the Union, poor old chap. The Union is the workhouse. You can go to the workhouse or you can go to America, but there's no, nowhere here for you. Um, and the stinging question that's posed by Larry Doyle in, in um, in, in the play is uh, how many million, how many of all those millions that have left Ireland have ever come back or wanted to come back? And Shaw warns his secretary for a period, Mabel Fitzgerald, who was son became Gary Fitzgerald, who was Taoiseach of Ireland for quite a long time. Um, but he, he wrote to her like, in the revolutionary period saying, um, he said, uh, we imagine we are democratic because we are rebellious. But when we have no longer any foreign tyranny to rebel against, we may discover that we have yet to learn the ABC of democracy. Um, so th this question all the time of, 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 of what it is you want to do. And I just want to go back to the speech that he makes in, in, in 1910, which is sort of anticipating home rule, anticipating the emergence of an independent Ireland. And Shaw is a great celebrity. Um, what does he choose to speak about in, in Dublin at that moment? He chooses to speak about the workhouse. And in particular, he chooses to speak about children, children, institutionalized children. Uh, he, um, one of the reasons why Shaw again should be our contemporary is that Shaw is one of the very first people 
uh, intellectuals to write about children as having rights in and of themselves, not through their parents. They're not property. And his, his concern for the rights of children is, 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 is extremely powerful. So what he chooses to speak on is the poor law and destitution in Ireland. This is not what people want. They want to be entertained by the great kind of witty Irishman, you know, the great celebrity returning to his own city. And what he does is he stands up and he says, do you know where I, where I spent the day? I, I suppose I think he's going to say, well, in Glendalough or something. He said, I spent the day in the South Dublin News. South Dublin is the biggest workhouse. Um, I, I spent the day there. And um, he talks about um, children. He says, um, there, were very, there were some very conspicuous things about the Irish workhouse. In the first place, they, this is reported in the, third, in the third person. In the first place, they had got too many of them. There was another thing. No child should ever be in a workhouse under any circumstances. In the workhouse of Ireland, workhouse of Ireland today, they have 8,000 children. That was a very large item of civic crime to begin with. They had no business to have any one of those children in the workhouse. It was the fact of the child being there that helped to make the workhouses as horrible as they were. He wondered if they believed in a day of judgment. If he were to judge by their civic conscience, he would say that they did not. Well, on that day of judgment, when it came, those 8,000 children that were in those workhouses today would stand up and say, what crime have I committed? He should not advise them to get up and ask what crimes they, the audience, had committed, because the 8,000 children would be able to give them an answer, and it would require all the mercy in heaven to prevent them from going to a place which would not be as bad as the ordinary workhouse. Uh, or so disorderly or wasteful or murderous or unpatriotic. But it might be quite as uncomfortable, therefore let them take care. So Shaw's address to a coming Irish nation is very much about, you know, what kind of rights are children going to have here. Um, and, and, and this is in fact kind of crucial to uh, the way in which, in which Ireland will develop. The great sin of independence Ireland is going to be the incarceration of one in every hundred children in institutions, and institutions which were as exactly as hellish as, as Shaw described them as being. So Shaw, I think, those three qualifications that Shaw puts down to, to Irish nationalism, the first one being um, that uh, you have to have a sense uh, of what comes after. Shaw's sense of Irish nationalism, and I think of nationalism in general, is that it is a kind of disease that you have to cure. Um, and, but you have to know what the healthy body looks like. What, what is it you, you can concentrate on? And the great fear of nationalism being that you, you exercise all your faculties on nationalism itself, and you lose the capacity to think about the future. You lose the capacity to actually think about what kind of society, what kind of polity, what kind of democracy you actually want to create. The second way qualification is that you cannot match people in place. You can't come up with a simplistic idea that the nation state is some sort of bounded entity with, with, with no connection to the outside world. One of the questions uh, Shaw poses to Mabel Fitzgerald, he says is, well, what are you going to do when you get an Irish Republic? Are you just going to sit around thinking how long the turf is going to last in Donegal? Um, you know, it, it has to have a sense of global connection. It has to be, uh, in a sense, one, one part of something larger. Shaw's unsure what that might be. He probably imagines what it might be as a, a sort of confederation of new republics which have taken the place of the old British Empire. Uh, that never quite happened. Uh, but one imagines that he would have been quite comfortable, for example, with Irish membership of the European Union. And the third great, great qualification is that um, actually nationalism um, cannot be based on any claim of ethnic or racial superiority. Um, this might seem rather obvious to us. It's not obvious for most of the history of the 20th century. And perhaps it is um, significantly less obvious in contemporary Europe and contemporary America uh, than, than it used to be. So I, I, I would suggest that um, Shaw remains contemporary, um, not necessarily in his reading of Irish nationalism, although that's very interesting to those of us who are Irish, 
But I think he remains contemporary in the way he consistently addresses those fundamental questions of, 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 of nationalism. Um, the ability to both accept that uh, national self-determination, a sense of identity, a sense of belonging, uh, are legitimate and, and valid aspirations that people have which must be addressed on the one side. And then to ask the most stinging questions about what kind of content are you going to give to that sense of belonging on the other side. I think remains fundamentally um, to the point in our contemporary dilemmas. And for that reason, if for none other, I think uh, some kind of return to Shaw might be sanitary. Thank you very much. I'm very conscious of keeping you from the now. I noticed I like, closed the door so you couldn't see the wine. Um, it's probably a very good idea, but I could do. But if anybody would like to make a point or ask a question, I'm not so sure. Thank you. A question about uh, a question of cosmopolitanism and how to frame that in relation to a figure like Shaw. There's obviously a tradition, in a sense, of uh, cosmopolitan revolutionaries yes. defending national causes from beyond borders. Um, Example of Ayatollah Khomeini comes to mind living in Paris before his triumphant return, but when you think of Lenin and various others. But there's also in Shaw's case that, that element of, the, of international socialism as being a kind of bedrock in a certain way of thinking. Yeah. So is that, is that part of the story? In, uh, yeah, I, I think it's a really interesting parallel you write, because one of the interesting things about Shaw is that he doesn't do what most cosmopolitan intellectuals who are nationalists do, which is, of course, um, use our cosmopolitanism to, to, to sort of be extreme in the demand for nationalism. Um, so he's not a Khomeini. He, he, he's not someone who from the outside says, you know, you must suffer for our nationalism. Um, on the contrary, his approach to our nationalism is, is always pragmatic. Um, so he supports Home Rule, for example, when that seems to be the best option. Um, he tries to change Home Rule to say, well, actually, which again is an extraordinary prescient, given where we are now with Brexit, where, where he says, um, actually, the solution to Home Rule is that there should be um, Home Rule Parliaments in Ireland, England, Scotland, and Wales. You know, wouldn't that be interesting? Um, he he supports the treaty, for example. He supports Michael Collins. So you know, he, he never takes a sort of extreme nationalist position, um, and he you know he, he continually tries to bring back the question to a sort of utilitarian one. So his socialism is is a, is a utilitarian one, you know, he, he, he wishes to see the greatest good for the greatest number and, and so he's continually asking that question around um, what, what kind of place can Ireland have in a socialist future um, uh, 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 and therefore, you know, his, his, his influence, if it lies anywhere, lies in, there is actually an extraordinary document which um, was the, I think, of the democratic program of the first Doyle which um, nobody in Ireland reads, but it, it, in the first, the first democratic assembly ever in Ireland, which was the, was the first all, which was elected in, in late 1918 and, and sat in Dublin in 19, uh, January 1919, passed a document called the Democratic Programme, and it's, it's, it's extraordinarily shavy in terms of its programme, I mean, it, it, because it says, it has one of those greatest lines, which is purely out of show, it says the, um, the first duty of the government of the Republic will be towards children. Uh, uh, kind of mocked, uh, you know, in its in its in its um, in its application. Um, but but Shaw's the Democratic program, uh, which was written by Thomas Johnson of the Labour Party, who had been a close associate of Connolly and Larkin, um, you know, it, it sort of picks up on a lot of Shaw's ideas around, around children uh, being the central yardstick by which you judge the health of a society. Um, it picks up on his attacks on the workhouses, for example. It picks up on all that kind of stuff. It's, 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 it's very much there. I don't know whether there's a very direct influence or whether he's drawing on the same uh, pool of, 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 of socialist ideas. Um, but um, th there's never a point at which Shaw ceases to sort of challenge Ireland you know, around. So he, he, he takes up the presidency of the um, Irish Academy of Letters, when Yates asks him to. Um, he takes that Irish citizenship, so 
two of the first people in England to take out Irish citizenship. It's quite late when somebody living in England could take up citizenship of the Irish Free State. Um, but himself and, and, and his wife were two of the first people in London, like right down to the Irish Embassy to take out Irish citizenship. So he, he, he retains that sense of being Irish all the way through. Um, but he uses it provocatively all the way through. 1948, for example, when the Republic of Ireland is declared by the government, the Irish Times asks Shaw, what does he think of it? And he says, well, um, ask me in a couple of years' time, and if life expectancy is better, and if, if um, infant mortality is better, then uh, it will have been a great success, and if not, then the only solution might be to uh, drown Ireland in the Irish Sea for 10 years and start all over again. You know, <laughs> There's always that kind of provocation. He's always kind of drawing, drawing back to this idea of, of, of as you say, cosmopolitanism into international standards of how you judge the success of a society rather than unique ideas of Irish genius. You know, it's always can you can you reach certain kind of levels of, 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 of um, human quality of life. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, I make this claim, which is <laughs> that that shows looking at two figures when he's kind of trying to invent GBS. Uh, and I mean, Wilde is a really obvious one, right? So so kind okay, of he's around Wilde. He's he's in those circles. He's watching what Wilde does. He, he learns a lot from Wilde around the idea of kind of personal provocation and around the idea of. Of dress. I mean, funny enough, the, the photograph when you come out the door here, you, the one that's looking at you, the, the young Shaw with his beard and his um, his his suit. We forget because we look at this sort of stuff. That Shaw is a dandy. You know, he's he's a sort of anti dandy dandy. So he, he uses the Jaeger suit and the tweeds as a as a as a statement, just just as much as as Wilde does with the green carnation. So. Um, I'm pretty sure that suit is the one that he bought when his father finally died and he got hundred pounds of insurance money and he bought the Jaeger suit and a packet of condoms uh, <laughs> with, with, with the hundred uh, pounds and, and finally lost his virginity because he had the suit. Um, so he's, he's very conscious of, of look, you know, he's very conscious of that. He takes a lot of that from, from, from Wilde. Um, and I suppose Tolstoy is the, is the sort of odd one that you don't associate with, but what he's trying to do is somehow to marry Wildean provocation with all its dandyism and all its sort of advertisements for oneself, with Tolstoy and seriousness, you know. So he, he wants to be both the provocateur and the saint. You know, he wants to be a saint. Um, and uh, I think some of this relates to um, his own particular spin on martyrdom, for example. He watches Wilde as, as a martyr. Um, he, he, he spends a lot of time, and so in the 1880s, early 1890s, when I mean, he's very much in Russian emigrant circles in London, he's, he's very interested in the idea of martyrdom that's emerging out of the sort of the Russian revolutionary city of kind of giving oneself self-sacrifice. Um, so he is, I, th I think it's, it's arguable that he is kind of marrying these, these two things together. Um, and. Um, it, it, I, I think they sort of save him, the combination saves him from the worst successes of both. So, um, so, so of course, he never becomes an aesthete in that sense. I mean, he, 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 never, um, he never retreats into pure surface aesthetically in the way that Wilde does so brilliantly, of course. Um, but on the other hand, he never also, he, he never, he, he stays funny in a way that Tolstoy never does. Um, I mean, Tolstoy really admired him, really read him vividly and, and you know, voraciously. There's a great report that I found, we found in the Irish Times of somebody who was with Tolstoy on his 80th birthday, you know, and wants to ask, ask Tolstoy all about Tolstoy, you know, being Tolstoy. Tolstoy keeps wanting to ask him about Shaw, you know, because he's he's from Ireland. Um, but but he 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 retains. So so what what the Wildian thing stops him doing, for example, is becoming a sort of neurotic, you know. He doesn't believe in the people. He doesn't believe in the national soul. He doesn't believe in, you know, there's a kind of real truth in the peasantry which we don't understand as intellectuals. He doesn't believe any of that stuff. Um, and I think kind of Wildean skepticism saves him from some of that stuff. So his, his particular combination of sort of understanding of nationalism and mobilization of, of national sentiment with 
a sort of scepticism and a, and, a, and a continual critical questioning, I think, uh, is probably fortified somehow by that combination. If that makes any sense. Thank you. Could you talk a bit more about the casement trial? Because it seems like a moment where I find Shaw hard to compass. Because on one hand, he seems, it reminds me of the moment when he refused to subscribe to Ulysses and wrote that wonderful letter about how no Irishman would pay for that. So it's like he's using this as a teaching moment to kind of, <coughs> we call it teaching moment, to kind of inform people about his ideas about martyrdom. But compared to, say, the compassion that he shows in the workhouse for children, it seems like potentially kind of a glib response to Casement. But I'm not sure if it is, because maybe it's just such a knowing, but he understands so well what's going to happen to Casement, because it does. Yeah. But, you know, could you talk a little bit more about maybe how the wild Yeah, I, I initially, when I, when I read, because I, I came across it through Beatrice Webb's diaries, and Beatrice Webb is there, and she's appalled by it. She just thinks this is absolutely dreadful, you know. How can you not give the money to so the poor woman who's looking for the money for, for Casement's uh, defence? And Shaw, you know, she, she's hard because being English, she doesn't get the idea of the national drama, you know. And, and so I, I, think, I think, first of all, Shaw understands exactly the genealogy of this moment. You know, he understands that it's, it's not just about Casement. It's a, it's a sort of sadomasochistic Irish nationalist moment, right, which is where we, we kind of enjoy being hanged once you've made a good speech, it's all fine, you know. Um, and so it's 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 very much, I think, comes out of a quite a deep understanding of the of the moment. It comes out of absolutely out of, out of Shaw's um, uh, arrogance, you know, thinking I can change this moment. I can actually intervene here in a way that will turn this moment into something else, so that you know, reverse the order. So so instead of being sentenced to death and then making a great speech, make a great speech so that they can't sentence you to death. And I think I think Shaw's point is brilliant, which is an English bourgeois jury will take enormous satisfaction in uh, a, a, a classic trial where Casement's lawyers say, no, he, he didn't do any of this. He's an innocent man. That's what you do in these in these trials. Um, he had wonderful lawyers. Um, they were fantastic. That we spent weeks going through the evidence. He's guilty. We can hang him. You know, it's no problem. Um, and what Shaw says is that's what they want to do, and they have great power. They give them power, so that you know he's thinking about an audience, which is the jury, a very specific audience. What do they feel? Well, they feel really self-satisfied and smug, and they feel they have absolute power. They've exercised the power of the state to hang this traitor. What Shaw is trying to say is no. Play with their psychology, which is. You think you have power, but actually you, you don't understand that you have no power. So what he wants Casement to say to them is, you have no power over me at all. You know, of course you can hang me, but, but so what? You know, if you hang me, I'm going to be William Wallace. I'm going to be you know, a, a figure for the ages. You're going to make me immortal. Is that what you want to do? You, know, you can hang me, but, but I'm going to win. The only way you can win here, the only way you can have power, is to say, oh, do we better hang him then? <laughs> so you, you exercise your real power as, as members of the jury. So it comes very, it's very much Shaw the dramatist thinking about how do I address an audience and, and thinking about who that audience is. And of course, he, he really knows an English middle class audience. You know, he, he, it's not, you could say it's, it's arrogant and it's, it's, it's sort of um, superior minded, but you know, he is shown by the stage that he really understands how to play on the feelings of an English middle class audience. It's very interesting that there is a letter, a late letter of, of Casement's before he's executed where he says, I should have used Shaw's defense. You know, I think Casement kind of realizes, actually, you know, they're always going to hang me. There's not, you know, I, I, I may as well have tried it. Um, and it would have, and actually Casement does use some of Shaw's phrases in his, in his he does the thing of being sent to death and then making the speech. Uh, and he uses some of the phrases, but I, I think at the end he, he thinks, oh, wouldn't it have been really, have been really interesting if I had tried to do what Shaw tried, tried to do? Of course, the reality is they probably would have still hanged the case once they, were, they, were, they weren't going to let him, let him go. Um, and, you know, of course, as you know, the, there was a huge campaign for clemency for casements, which was an international campaign, which the British government countered by, they, they got hold of casements' homosexual diaries and they, they showed the diaries to selected people to, and it is remarkable the number of people who, who pulled back from that, you know, and said, oh God, we better not support Casement because he's, he's queer. Um, the horror of, 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 of this figure. 
Um, and of course, the irony is that Joe would have been one of the few people who would not have been sh shocked about him because he'd been through the wilds. He'd been through the, he'd been there before. You know, he, he'd, he had, Shaw was at the dinner, so he was at lunch in the Cafe Royal when Wilde came in to talk to Frank Harris to say, I've just lost the libel trial. I want, there's going to be a trial of me now, and I want you to go in, into court and say um, that um, Dorian Gray is not a moral book. And Frank Harris says to him, are you out of your mind? Do you think it's going to be about whether Dorian Gray is in a moral book? They're going to call the servants from the hotel. They're going to get the sheets from the bed and display them. Do you not realize what's going to happen here? And, I mean, Shaw is right there. I mean, right there for this martyrdom. Where, and as Shaw describes later, that, that Wilde is convinced that just get on the train, get on, you know, don't be a martyr right now. <laughs> and then Bosey, who is Wilde's lover, comes in and the whole thing unravels and, and Wilde goes ahead. But, you know, so, so his, I think his sense of the case one thing is, is governed partly by his memories of Wilde. It's, it's governed by, you know, all, all sorts of ideas about trying to manipulate ideas of martyrdom to prevent a martyrdom, you know, which is a sort of you know, typical shabby paradox, I think. But it, it, it would have been a really interesting moment if, if it had been done, I think. won't keep us much longer. The door is open now so you can receive refreshments. They're taunting you. Um, I just want to say personally, great, like, offer my gratitude to Finton and all the speakers this evening. It's been a fascinating few hours personally and uh, professionally I offer um, my thanks on behalf of Consul General and the Embassy of Ireland to Ruth, uh, Barry, Dara, Finton, everyone that's been involved in the exhibition and the book. Um, it's been fantastic work to ensure that Perhaps one of Ireland's lesser known, it's a great phrase, lesser known major writers uh, continues uh, to, or perhaps garners further attention. Um, I was just saying it's been a fantastic series of coincidences how I've been involved or tangentially involved in the, the exhibition. I met Ruth and Barry a week before I left Ireland to move to DC and we had a discussion about how we could ensure that the exhibition reached a wide audience here in the States. Um, I moved to DC and last week I was sent up to New York um, to help uh, advance President Higgins' visit. So I'm delighted to be able to be here this evening. And uh, also just to know that President Higgins actually will be speaking here in Columbia next week on Thursday. Um, so they'll be releasing further information. It's part of the World Leaders uh, Forum series. So they'll be releasing information in the coming days. So I hope you'll all be able to join us on that occasion as well. Um, We've heard a decent, or we heard earlier on the speakers mention kind of what had happened around Shaw Day in Ireland. And just to note that the interest around Shaw hasn't been purely based in Ireland. And your work, or Ruth and the RA's work, hasn't also all been based in Ireland. There's been fantastic interest here in the States um, on the exhibition. And we launched it, or we had it first shown in the Consul General, uh, Consul General's office in New York in January. We had a meeting of about 60 representatives from Irish art centres across the States were there. And um, so they're actually going to host, right, a number of them are actually going to host the exhibition throughout the year. So it's gone from here to Princeton. It'll be in George Washington University at some point in DC. The Gaelic American Club in Connecticut are hosting it. Niagara on the Lake will uh, host it at the Shaw Festival, which is a fantastic festival in a great town. If you've not been, I recommend it. Um, and the Irish Centre in Cincinnati will host it. And then at some point towards the end of the year, it'll make it to the West Coast um, at an Irish uh, book festival in San Francisco. So hopefully we're spreading the word of Shaw throughout the states. And so on that note, I'll just say thank you again to, to everyone that was involved and say it's been a fantastic afternoon and evening. And I suppose let's uh, discuss Shaw further over, over refreshments. Thank you.